Welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Joe Lalo, and I'm here with Lindsay Baroker and Andrea Pearson, right. <laughs> who is also eating a burrito, and uh, she's not busy because she's a mom, and it's the only <laughs> time she can fit in to eat. Multitasking I, and productivity. I'm done eating. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right, so well, what are we going to talk about today? All right, well, let me apologize first for my voice. We interviewed Mark just this past Monday. And he was coming down with a cold and he's like, hey, did you get a cold too from 20 books? I was like, nah, no. Nah. And then like Tuesday, no, yeah, Tuesday morning I woke up, but my throat was just dying. And so I'm still recovering from that. And hopefully my voice will um, hold out because I want to talk to you guys. We want to talk to you about some of the things I thought were interesting at 20 books at the conference. Um, not really panel coverage this time because I was busy. Somehow I ended up on four this is what happens if you write across genres. <laughs> I was like, space opera, yes. Fantasy, yes. And then um, the high-powered uh, authors at the beginning. And also one on Patreon, Kickstarter, and Selling Direct, which I had only a little bit of experience with, but I was willing to be there at 7.45. So I think that that was why I was on that one. Um, but I did take some notes here and there. I attended a few of the talks and also I've since listened to a few more there. If you're curious, you can uh, go on YouTube and look up. I think it's just if you look 20 books, Vegas, 2019, there's at least 20 of them up there. The sound is pretty good on the ones that were in the main theater. And it's a little iffier on the ones that were recorded back in some of the smaller rooms. Uh, while I was there, I got to talk to reps from Google Play. Uh, I believe I teased on the last episode that we would chat a little bit about that because that was my first time interacting with them at all. And also Amazon. And I had a, you know, conversations with cool folks. So I just kind of point, uh, took down some points of interest and I will say what they were in the show. Uh, like we we're talking about good Google play, good reads, what's Amazon up to. And um, I will ask Joe and Andrea what their thoughts are or if they have any experience because some of the things we're going to talk about like Goodreads giveaways and things uh, I'm sure these guys have tried and I've also tried. So before we get into all that, do you guys have any new news that you want to share? Andrea? Yeah, um, I've got um, my first course discount that I've been, I've done in a while going on right now just because I got interviewed with Joanne and I was like, well, might as well do a course of course discount. So if you want 30% off one or however many of my courses, um, and they're all marketing courses, go to selfpublishedoncourses.com to see what I've got available and enter in discount count, disc, discount, discount code <laughs> yellow at checkout. So that's the color yellow. Um, my courses are between five and $50 and they cover topics like reviews, um, getting reviews, automation sequences, Amazon algorithms, um, running big promotions, um, finding subscribers, things like that. And that's pretty much it for now. I'm still working on Evening Storm, that second book in my Midnight Chronicles, and that's supposed to be published to Amazon in a week and a half. So yay, go me. I'm way behind. <laughs> it is the time of year where we get behind. <laughs> um, and yeah, I have not taken any of your courses, Andrea, but I remember when we first met at the WMG class, you were like, having your hours at one of the little tables, you know, and people were just coming by to ask you questions. And, you know, uh, I know you really love to talk about the marketing stuff. So I imagine people would definitely get a lot out of them. Um, for my own news, I just want to say thank you to everyone who said hi at the 20 books conference uh, and that they appreciate the podcasts. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I think Chris Fox made a post too about <laughs> being socially awkward and not being the person who will ever, ever walk up to a group and just kind of insert yourself into the, the edge and try to work yourself in. So it, it's nice for me when people come up to me because then I don't have to stand there, you know, texting on my phone, pretending I'm so busy. So, so many things I have to check in on my Facebook groups, you know. So I appreciate that, everyone. And hopefully you had a good conference if you were there. Uh, I also wanted to correct. Um, I think last two, two episodes ago, I said I was going to be at a conference with um, Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon in, I said Memphis, it's in Nashville. I apologize to people. Those are very different cities. I understand, <laughs> even though I'm horrible with the South as someone who's always lived on the, the West Coast. Um, and it's in May 2020, May 16th to 17th, and it's called the Career Author Summit. Um, you can check. I'm not sure if they still have uh, slots open, but... Uh, and I'll also be in April in California at the Fantasy Fest. 
and this is something Jasmine Walt put together. Um, she's a pretty popular indie fantasy author and she likes organizing events and stuff. And this is kind of a reader slash author convention for fantasy fans with uh, workshops, panels, parties, games, book readings, and a Ren Fair themed book signing event. That was news to me. I hope I don't have to dress up because not really into that stuff. <laughs> I don't even dress up in real people clothing, much less uh, fairy clothing. But uh, she said there's also going to be classes on craft writing and stuff for indie publishing for writers. So fun stuff. That's all I've got for news. How about you, Joe? Uh, it was for me. I, uh, I, I officially finished up my Nano novels first draft. Uh, and for the first time, for my entire writing career, I've been trying to learn to write shorter. So the, the, the pull is always to shorten things up. And for the first time, I came up substantially under my projected word count. I'm at 81,000 words, and this is an epic fantasy. Uh, the shortest book in this series is 125,000 words. So I have uh, uh, about 15 to 20,000 words worth of linkers and like shortened scenes that I needed to add. And then I had sort of a big question mark of like, am I adding a, a B plot in this section? And the answer to that question is yes, I'm adding a B plot to that section. This has got to be satisfying because book six might be the end of this whole narrative arc. Uh, the book of Deacon will continue, but not, not in the, the, the same sequence of characters and events. So I got I to gotta make sure I do a good job of it. Fortunately, my deadline with the editor is not until next year. I'm going to probably have another full novel written between when I finish this and when I actually have to give it to somebody. I've also got some some cover work getting done, and it frankly is hilarious to like uh, receive an email from a, a compositing type cover maker, like Photoshop type. But they're like, all right, here's an array of people. Um, pick one. It makes me feel very uncomfortable. But anyhow, that's where I am right now, preparing who knows how many book releases and having for the first time that I can remember to uh, bulk up a book so that it feels epic. Yes, you're going to have to just do better because my first urban fantasy is 83,000. Yeah. You cannot be shorter than an urban fantasy novel no, for I an epic not. fantasy. We won't say anything about how I go long, but I, I always have the audiobooks in mind these days, especially for a book one. I don't want anything super short that's going to be not a good use of the credit. Something, by the way, that's funny about me going short on this one is I had to set aside another book in the same setting that's set early on and it is at like 195,000 words. So if I could just borrow like 50,000 of those words, it'd be fantastic. They'd both be at a better length, but that's me. The joys of uh, having a muse that doesn't always cooperate with, uh, I'm kind of, I admire those people, they can just kind of knock out like 80,000 every time, <laughs> you know, like whatever is appropriate for their genre every time. Um, but let's go ahead and get into chatting about this stuff. I, I forgot to mention, we also have some Q&A stuff at the end. So if we run out of material here, we'll, uh, we'll answer some of the questions. You guys have been kind enough to come by the blog and ask. So first, let's talk about Amazon and Goodreads. They had a lot of reps there. I think that was basically, I think, Craig, Craig Martell, who put on the, you know, he basically does most of it. Um, I know Michael Anderley, he was there too, and his wife, Judith, who actually we're going to mention for her foreign rights talk here in a bit. Um, but Craig really hustles and does a lot of work for these conferences. And he was just getting people there. Anybody you might want to talk about, he was trying to talk to. He was trying to get there. And I think Amazon had like 16 or 17 reps. And I got to sit down uh, for about an hour, actually, under the waterfall, which uh, makes sense to those of you who have been to Sam's, <laughs> Sam's Town and chat with three of them. I felt like some sort of high-powered author, literally, <laughs> having a little chat. But... Um, so if you've never chatted with an Amazon rep at any of these conferences, they basically ask you for questions and get your feedback. And it's a little intimidating because they're there with their laptops and they're taking notes and they're like, is this going to be used against me in a court of law or court of Amazon? But they always want to know what you think about things. They tend to be very elusive. You know, I always ask them things. I've come with my questions and they're like, well, that, that may be coming or I can't say anything about that. And uh, apparently I actually asked like, would one of you guys come on the, podcasts and that they have different tiers of people and you have to be a certain tier to be kind of allowed to go out there and publicly say the, the things that Amazon once said. So that's probably why you have not heard many Amazon reps on podcasts. I, I think Mark Dawson got a UK Amazon person on their show this summer. You can check that out if you're interested. Um, but so they, they have had both at Nink and at this conference uh, a rep there for the advertising stuff. Not just AMS ads, which most any of us can do, 
but kind of talking to authors about, do you want to be doing the higher level stuff? Uh, you know, Mark talked about the Amazon media group ads and how it's like about a $35,000 commitment if you wanted to get in that. And it's, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. I've actually talked to somebody over the phone about it and I'm thinking of trying it next year, but I've also heard two years ago was the time <laughs> it was ideal to try it as an author before anybody really knew about it. Now that they're actively realizing they can get authors, you know, cause they're obviously want you to spend the money. That's super advertising for them in general, Amazon ads. So, and I don't know, honestly, if my, any of my stuff really converts that well that I could make it worth that much money. Uh, I've been struggling, honestly, all along with PPC ads to like, you know, can I actually spend anywhere, can I make anywhere nearly as much as I'm spending just from the ads? And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be curious going into urban fantasy, if maybe it's a little bigger audience and maybe I can do a little better. Um, it's, it's really something I, I keep trying to get better at and I end up getting frustrated and, and targeting the entire category, which you should not do. You should just get a few authors and target them. Um, but anyway, I think the most interesting thing, one of the reps was a Goodreads person and they also had a panel. So if you saw that, I don't know if I'm giving you anything new, but um, actually before I jump into the Goodreads stuff, do you guys have any comments on Amazon advertising or anything? I don't want to like just read to people for the whole show. <laughs> no, go ahead and read to people for the whole show. <laughs> I don't, I don't you need dessert any. now? <laughs> you got the dessert burrito and you need five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't really have any comments yet. So if Joe does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Amazon advertising, it's uh it's amazing how like I spoke earlier uh, in, in earlier episodes about how I took a deep dive into uh, into BookBub and like I started to get a, gri a grips on it and I had had some success with Amazon advertising and uh, it's it's like it's like it knew that I was cheating on it because as soon as I uh, as I was like, OK, BookBub, I think I'm going to be able to do something with this. All of my my pre existing like, OK, these ads are doing pretty good. I could just do look alike ads and stuff. They started tanking, so uh, uh, I feel like I have gone backwards in AMS. Every time I get any sort of understanding, things change. So, yeah, AMS is tricky. I should say that if I was actually helping a friend that had like a two hundred dollar a month budget, I could probably make it work. Where I struggle is like I can make it work with really small ads, really targeting really specific keywords that are really related to my book, but. Uh, it's so small an amount compared to like what I sell every month that I'm like, well, why am I even wasting my time doing this? I should just be writing the next book. So I get impatient and I'm like, well, let's just, let's just go all space opera, all galactic empires, you know? So I end up, you know, hitting whole categories and that's where it's just really, you know, I wouldn't say impossible, but uh, I think that anybody's going to have a hard time having a good uh, return on investment in that. And that's where you get into like, okay, I got to, I have, I have an eight book series. I can afford to spend $10 maybe getting a reader for book one. And I don't know. Uh, we're going to talk about with Goodreads here a little bit. I'm certainly thinking myself, like I would kind of want to not be on this treadmill of trying to compete with all these other authors for these clicks on Amazon. So I'm sort of thinking like, what, what are some of the things that have worked over the years that still work that it just, you know, that I could focus on maybe a little more. So I was quite interested in talking with the, the Goodreads rep and um, she, so you know I think most of you probably are familiar with Goodreads and know that it was not originally owned by Amazon they picked it up five or six years ago and they've definitely made some changes it's more linked to the Kindle specifically in the Amazon store now um, I honestly had drifted away from it I used it early on you know I did some giveaways and then I don't remember if it was when Amazon bought them or just around that time, they, the giveaways suddenly were no longer free. It used to be like you could give away an ebook for free. And those go out to, you know, I'm not sure if it's their newsletter subscribers or just people that are on the site get notified of new giveaways or maybe just people that want free books are hanging out. But so you can easily get like a thousand people interested in a giveaway. And I believe that to, enter the giveaway, they have to add the book to like their to read shelf or something. So there's a little potential of a little bit of viral activity. Uh, and with the eBooks, you can give away up to a hundred. At this point, I noticed it was only the Amazon US Kindle store. So that was a bummer because I'm really, right now I'm like, well, I wanna get the global sales. Like I love Amazon US. I'm always gonna keep trying to sell stuff there, but um, I'm like, man, how can I reach all those other people in the other stores and other countries? But 
Uh, she pointed out that good uh, that the giveaways right now you can do ebook or print giveaway. Uh, it used to be free. It's now five hundred ninety nine for a premium one or one hundred and ninety nine for a regular one, and you can give away like I said up to one hundred ebooks. And it's sort of like, I think when these first started, came on the market, everybody was like, oh, that's way too much money. But now I'm like, well, look how much AMS ads are. You know, that's really, especially the 199 one seems pretty reasonable uh, in conjunction with maybe a new release. Or I'm actually trying one right now. And maybe I can give you guys an update in the future. Like, was it worth it uh, for my three book, Star Kingdom Omnibus, which is 999. So I was kind of like, well, even if I only just give away 100 copies, they're actually you know, they're facilitating it in such a way I don't have to pay a hundred times 999 to do it. So I'm giving that a shot. That's a new release for me. Basically it's a, you know, like I said, the first three books in the box set and I've been trying to push it because there's also, it's linked to the audiobook that just came out. Did you guys ever do Goodreads giveaways yourself? Like when they were free or since they've been paid and, and what were your thoughts on them? I used to do Goodreads. I used to do them all the time back in the day, you know, like six or seven years ago and they, were really effective for me, but then everybody started finding out about them. I haven't tried them since they've gone paid, but I've had a couple people tell me that they were very effective. And so if you feel like forking over the money, then I mean, and again, honestly, it's not that expensive when we consider how much we're spending on advertising. Um, but the Goodreads, you said they ha they can, sh like you have followers and you have a way to, f I, I didn't even know you could have followers on Goodreads. Is that a thing then? Yeah, I actually have like three or 4,000 just, you know, by lieu of having been an author and, and publishing and been out there. Because like I said, I haven't been active on there at all since like 2012. Um, in the beginning, I also did some of the giveaways. And I, in the beginning, <laughs> way back in the old days, I had to manually put my books into the get Goodreads. I think it's either automated now or there's librarians you know behind the scenes doing it because I remember having to apply for like a librarian status and being able to do it yeah it's I think it's automate automatic right now like I've had them sync over from Nook you know and but then I also have readers that will follow and whenever I release a new book they make sure the description's correct the cover's correct and everything and and Joe you had you've done Goodreads giveaways haven't you uh, I haven't done Goodreads giveaways, but I was fairly active on Goodreads for a while. I, I, I don't have 5,000 followers. I think I have 500 followers. But uh, uh, like I ended up getting some really good feedback from, from readers. And also, I enjoy the, the questions. Like I don't get very many questions anymore, but you, there's an Ask the Author section if you are a, you know, a Goodreads author. And I've had some really good uh, uh, back and forth on that. Also, one of the things about Goodreads that's useful is you can link your blog. Like if you have your, your own website blog, you can link the feed to Goodreads and it will repost it there too. And I've gotten a surprising number of people who found my website and found my books via the, the blog posts that, that get repeated there. So it's just sort of a signal booster if you happen to use your blog very much. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up myself because I, I put mine on there years ago and forgot about it, but it just automatically does new stuff. And I also I'll get a like or something, you know, from from the Goodreads side. So I think I have it so they can just read the whole blog post there. They don't have to come to my site. Um, in addition to the giveaways, they have newsletter blasts. The, these are mostly trad publishing right now. Hang on, guys, I got a cough. I'm going to talk to fill the silence, <laughs> poor Lindsay. I don't know what I'm going to talk about to fill the silence, but I'm going to talk to fill the silence. <laughs> We've said that I was going to hold up Squee, so yeah, I got to hold up Squee. That's, oh, yeah, that's Squee, that's everybody. Right. <laughs> Very good. I just put a cough drop in, so I'm going to try to not clack it or anything too much, but hopefully that will help. Um, so they have newsletter blasts too that will go out to fans of the genre that are signed up for it. And she actually wasn't trying to steer me toward it, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if that means it's not, they're not effective or she just didn't think indie authors would pay enough. Um, but they, she's, cause she said they're like 1500 and up and you need to reach out to them and talk to someone to get booked. So I might give it a shot at the next release. I mean, again, Comparing that to like, what's the option of $35,000 with AMG ads? 1500 is a lot, but um, I would be curious just uh, to talk to them and see like how many people is this gonna go out to if, if I were to purchase one. Um, she also mentioned 
that you can create a fan group on Goodreads as a place to kind of gather some of your loyal people. These may be the same people that like ask the questions. I used to get a lot more of that too. And I don't know if it's because I haven't been active that I haven't gotten as many or if there are just less people using that feature now, but they used to be able to, or they can still say like, hey, this is my favorite character. Are they ever gonna come back in another book? And you could answer it and then everybody else could see the question. But uh, as far as if you created a fan group just for yourself, and you actually, you have fans at this point so that there would be people in it. <laughs> she mentioned that you could use it as a way to kind of gather together reviewers for an ARC team. Um, and I, I thought this was kind of interesting because you can actually see the people, are they reviewing on Goodreads versus if you've ever tried to put together an ARC team like through a Facebook group. I used to ask people to send me a review they'd done on Amazon just so I knew they, they actually reviewed books before I would let them in. And that was always a pain in the butt and there was always some confusion. So I'd rather just be able to stock them ahead of time without asking for anything. So Goodreads could help facilitate your stocking of, of your readers. And you'd still have to use Book Funnel or something to distribute the books. I, I don't think there was any feature built into the fan group. I, I would have to take a peek and see if you could upload files. Um, but you, I feel like these fan groups are not closed secret groups. So. I don't know. I, I will check it out. Like I said, I have a list for the next series I launch and I'm going to try some of these Goodread things because like I said, advertising is getting crazy. So I want to try to find some other things that can be effective, you know, without going into that. Do you guys have any thoughts on that or is that something, or do you do an art team now? Cause it's something I did away with cause it was, you know, you're kind of hand dealing with people. I was always trying to make it an automated thing. This was before book funnel. So it's easier now, but I found with a uh, Facebook group, it actually had a lot of drama between people fighting and arguing over the books within the group. And I was just like, I don't need this drama. <laughs> I don't need to administer this stuff. But, and it's, it's, it's like, it's worth it because you can get like a hundred reviews on day one if you have a, a team, but then you have to hand, you know, do it's how much effort do you want to put into like, here's the book, following up with people. Did you review the book? You know, making sure they can un download the book. Uh, what are you guys doing with ARC teams right now? I have, uh, I've done like three different ways of trying to manage ARC teams. I have a, uh, a Facebook secret group for them and that hasn't been terribly successful. I actually, I didn't have a team on Goodreads, but I had a series of people who only communicated with me through the Goodreads message system. Uh, that was a little bit difficult to, to wrangle. And uh, then I have like a, an, uh, for my newsletter, I have a subset of my, of my readers who have volunteered to be ARC people. And, I've just had a lot of difficulty getting people to, uh, you know, reliably provide review. Like you need an enormous number of them to have a reliable number that will actually have reviews up uh, when the time comes. So I just slowly let it drop away so that now I'll do an announcement early sometimes and see if there's any takers, but my art group is virtually zero at the moment. Um, I've got a fairly healthy um, ARC group. I call it ARCast, Andrew's Review Crew and Street Team. Um, in the beginning, I tried running it on Facebook, but I found so many of my readers weren't on Facebook and I just, I hated having to go to Facebook for another reason. And so I let that group die. And I know that like for romance authors, Facebook is huge, you know, but for me, it's not so big. And so a lot of romance authors run their lists completely on Facebook, but you know, um, that works for them. It did not work for me. I liked the person the more personable approach that comes through doing email. And so I moved away from Facebook. I've always had it on, even when I had it on Facebook, I always had it on, on email newsletter and I keep a specific group just for it separate from my, my main group, just so I can see how healthy they are. Um, I have noticed that I will get, um, about 40% of people will review. And so if I want a specific number of, of reviews, then I aim to have a, I aim to hand out a specific number of copies and I run my group not super strict. I mean, there's a lots of, lots of different, you know, there's the strict and then the not so strict. And I'm talking so that Lindsay will have a little bit more of a break <laughs> for her poor voice. Um, but my group is strict in that I require people to post two reviews before they join. And I don't like Lindsay, I don't like a whole lot of work. And so I don't make them, I don't ever verify that they posted those reviews and sorry to my readers who, if they might, none of my readers are listening, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't verify that they post those reviews. I just go on the honor code and I haven't been burned yet. And then um, I, I have a lot of grace in my system, meaning like if somebody gets sick, I don't 
kick them off the team. I very rarely kick people off my team. I will do cleanings regularly where I send an email and say, hey, would you like to stay on my team still? Um, another thing that I've done with my review crew is um, because I've got so many books now, the question people always ask is which ones are most important to read and in which order. So I've got an automatic, automatic sequence set up that leads them, leads them book by book through all of my main series and through all of my books. And uh, I had my assistant set that up and it was a pain in the butt, but, um, and I have it optional where that first email that goes out, I say, if you would rather go at your own pace, all of my emails to my street team include links to download my books. And um, I'm sure I have people that abuse that, but I don't care because I still get reviews regularly enough where it's not a big deal. And my street team's not big enough where it's a big deal to lose those freebies that they're downloading without reviewing. Um, but they, if they would rather go at their own pace, then they can opt out of the automatic email system. And so I just remove them by hand. And I've only had one person opt out and the rest, you know, it takes months to get through my whole catalog. And so they get an email every three to four days. and um, Every single email has a link to a spreadsheet where they go and upload their reviews. And if they don't want to, they can email their review link to my assistant and she takes care of it. And it's the way it's set up. It's not a whole lot of work. Um, and honestly, I don't, I, like I said, I run my list sometimes really strict and sometimes not strict. And so sometimes I don't even care if they're posting reviews because it's just so far on the back burner. Um, and then I go through phases where I'm like, okay, well, let's make sure they're actually posting reviews and then I'll do a clean of the list and everything. But, um, I usually get around 40 to 60 reviews on launch day, depending on the size of my, my group. I have had up to hundred on launch day and it really does help. Um, but I don't want it to be a big time suck. And so they know that I might, sometimes it'll take me a month to respond to emails and they send me links to their reviews. And then I will, I will wait a few weeks and then send them one and that says, thank you so much for the reviews. I've been watching them coming through your emails coming through and I really appreciate it. And I do random giveaways just to make sure they feel special. And so that people are more likely to stick around, but I don't know, I've kind of toyed with the idea of dropping it just because sometimes it is a pain in the butt to make sure they get copies, you know, even through book funnel and all of my review team, they know how book funnel works. And so I don't ever have problems with them downloading, but it's still one extra step in my to-do list. And I don't know, but I have relationships with a couple of them where I would feel bad if I were to suddenly yoink, you know, yoink, take those books away from them and because they very loyally review on every single retailer. And so, you know, it's kind of hard. I don't know. Uh. No, I have people that still email me. I have a couple that are like, can I, they're, you know, can I get a new book? Like it's been four years since I disbanded the review team. And I was like, yeah, sure. Here it is. They, they're fine downloading it straight out of the email. And I should say it actually, it did work. Like I definitely saw value in it in getting all those reviews on day one. Um, another reason I think I, I got away from it was because Amazon started deleting reviews of anybody that was like a friend of yours on Goodreads. And I was like, well, shoot, I've got like 800 people I accepted friend requests from back in the day, you know? And so that got a little frustrating. I was like, well, let me, and also I got to the point where I could just ask in the back of the book, like, if you enjoy this, please leave a review. And you know, they would come in pretty quickly on a new book. So I am thinking about it. Um, cause I've talked about, I'm going to jump into urban fantasy in a few months and it's new to me subgenre. So I think lots of my people will come over, but I, I'm thinking about things like maybe putting a novella up on Wattpad as you know, just to try to get some new, urban fantasy people not just my specific readers already so i'm thinking about all this stuff <laughs> we'll see uh, i'll be happy to talk about the launch and how it goes uh, afterward probably march ish all right one other thing the goodreads rep mentioned was that um the goodreads readers choice awards you may get those <laughs> you know information about those i've been nominated in two past years no, you know, I didn't do anything. They just nominated me. So I really appreciated that. But she was pointing out that if your book is not on there, like I noticed this year, there was hardly any indie sci-fi. I'm not sure there was any indie sci-fi uh, in the first round of nominations that it's, you know, you could ask your readers like, hey, if you enjoyed this particular book I released this year, would you please consider writing me in as a nomination? And it has to be done during that first week when they, they start the Goodreads. You know, it's this whole thing where there's, these are the nominated books. Then these are the, I don't know, the semifinalists, finalists. And then here's the winner. And I actually went through one year, like the first year I actually told all my people, I was like, oh, you guys, I got nominated. Please vote for me in the semifinals. And they did. And I got to the 
finals or I don't know, I had asked them to vote three times. It's like vote in the first round, vote in the semifinals, vote in the finals. Cause I actually got, you know, the book by asking my readers, I got it in there. And then I found out when the finals, you know, shows the final votes, like how many, how many each book got. It was like, here's me, Star Nomad, 2,700 votes. Woo! Neil Gaiman, <laughs> you know, whatever he published that year, 47,800 votes. I was like, okay, I did not sell that many copies of my entire book, much less getting that many people to vote for it. So as far as actually winning as an indie author, good luck. But <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, actually, Goodreads, I'm on their site right now. So it's best books of 2019, but it's already done. You can't nominate more books. I mean, we're not done with 2019. No, it, it comes out, I think it's early November. So you have to be paying attention every year. Like if, they'll send you an email if you're on Goodreads. Like I got one. Um, so anything so, published after that email goes out will not be considered. Right. It's okay. everything. It's a once a year thing. It's like all That's the awards. That's bad for all the authors who write books that are later in the year. <laughs> well, they wait till like early November, I think was when it went out. Um, but the point of all this is, like, you're probably not going to win unless you're Neil Gaiman. No. <laughs> no, that was depressing. I'm not saying that. But it's really going to be a tough road as a self-published author because the, the big trad authors just get so many book sales and so many readers. But all during this process, your book is basically being highlighted on their website. And I had a lot of people add Star Nomad to their reading lists um, during that period. I, I really got a noticeable, noticeable bump that year that I did all that. So maybe it's worth it. If you actually think you've, you know, written something that your readers really love, you know, a particular book in your series, and you want to ask them to vote for you, a lot of people have Goodreads accounts. So, I mean, there's like, she had mentioned that there's 95 people, 95, 95 million people um, with Goodreads accounts. So you just, uh, just mentioning it to your regular list could be enough if you wanted to try to do that. If they didn't just nominate you because you're fabulous on your own. <laughs> All right, Joe, did you have a comment on Goodreads before we move on to Google Play? Uh, yep. Uh, a couple of years ago, probably, I don't know, a number of years ago, I was at Book Expo America and Goodreads was there and they had brought on a case study. The, the woman who they were talking about was on stage explaining this. And she had done a concerted marketing effort around the Goodreads Reader's Choice Awards. And uh, if I still have a, the notes on this, I should dig them up. Although by now, it's enough years ago, I'm sure the information is stale. Uh, they got a USA Today bestseller, basically, they got on the list on the strength of their, of their Reader's Choice campaign, because they pointed out they have, Goodreads keeps reasonably good stats in the back, in the back end, and they were showing how like every round uh, that you make it through, you have this big spike in people who are checking out your, your books, and there are, uh, there are like n number one reviewers who like have huge followings on Goodreads who will just do a review of every book in a certain round. And then all of a sudden you're being echoed to their fans and they just show these shocks and aftershocks and very lo like healthy long tails on Goodreads activity. And uh, they coordinate it with a couple of giveaways which were free at the time and aren't anymore. So uh, like if you, if you can work the system, Goodreads at least you know, probably 2015 was a, a tremendously effective tool. And I can't imagine that, that, that uh, it has diminished too much since then. So there's ways to play it just like any other game. She said that it was 80 million subscribers when Amazon bought it and now they're up to 95 million. So it does like, I feel like I've actually dissed Goodreads. <laughs> I started the meeting with like, Hey, is Goodreads ever going to get an update? So the site's less 1997 and a little more functional and easier to navigate. And she said they're working on it. So we shall see. I heard from someone apparently that the app is not too bad. So, but I did notice, I actually asked my, after this conference, I went to my Facebook author page and said, Hey, how many of you guys are actually still active on Goodreads? And, you know, some were there, a lot were not, which was like, to me, that actually meant maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe I could get readers that I don't already have by being a little, doing a few of these good giveaways. And as, a, you know, alternately, I've asked before, how, how did you find my books? And like, there's an amazing number of people that were like, I first found your books on BookBub. Like a crazy, that was like the highest, most answered thing. So I was like, okay, well, I may have saturated how many people I can get from BookBub. I don't know if that's true, but so this seemed like maybe an opportunity. Uh, I will see in the future. Dog shaking off in the background. 
That's for Laura and Dan who noticed that when they were on their road trip to Vegas. Victoria gets up, shakes her collar, shakes her ears and moves to a different dog bed. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Google Play. You know, I went up to their, their suite on the eighth floor of the <laughs> Sam's Town and uh, they had four people there. Um, you know, these guys are probably more out of the tech side than the book side, but they, they had, were able to answer my questions. And I also asked them, I was like, are you guys maybe going to make any upgrades for improved reporting to make it a little easier? And, and then just there's so many people that haven't been able to get an account there that want to upload direct. Because as we talked about last week with Mark, draft a digital had to sever things with Google Play or Google Play severed things with them. So right now, the only way to get in there is by making an account and uploading books directly. And I should say, I, I certainly find it worth it. They're usually my number two or number three after Amazon and usually after Barnes and Noble right now, as far as income goes. Even, you know, I'm sitting at like maybe six months since I last had a, a book bub for something. I'm not sure, but uh, even like they don't fall off as quickly. I'm going to talk about why in a minute, but uh, there is, I just wanted to say there's, I asked why it's so hard to get an account still. Like for a while they were closed for two new accounts because of piracy or something. And then there, I've heard people say, well, you can only get an account if you're in the U.S. So I asked if that's true. And they said, no, they're actually, if you're in any of the 41 countries where they sell books, uh, eBooks, that you can get an account. And if people had had problems, it's because they send out basically a verification email with a code. And if your email went into like a spam box or promotions or something, you never saw it. That's just it. You're not going to get another one. I don't know if you've ever had readers try to sign up for your list and they didn't get that verification email and they have to email you. Can you manually go put me in there? And they're like, yes, maybe. <laughs> but so I don't know. Are you guys on Google Play right now? And did you have any trouble getting accounts? I am on Google Play. Uh, I also, it's, it's been, it was a huge earner for me a few years ago. It's, it's dropped down to like third or fourth place or fourth or fifth place it is recently. But I got on it super early, like, like, like b way before there was any, any concern about shutting it down. And I've been doing pretty good ever since. Uh, I will say that uh, I have noticed that they have changed their back end a little bit. Like the, the user interface for it, for their, stuff has gotten a lot slicker and cleaner and uh, yeah so they're definitely working on it which is nice because you know it's a gigantic market that i would very much like to have a, a greater impact on yeah i've actually noticed that too like there when we first started an account there i don't know it's probably been seven years or something it was right when they first opened up um it was so hard to navigate and then the stupid price settings you had to set a price and you had to create a worldwide location and price and i hated that it was so tedious but um i've i still have problems with them randomly dropping the price and amazon trying to price match and so my rule of thumb which i probably should change honestly is i've only had box sets there and then i just you know and i've had all my box sets there and i just have the price be three or four dollars higher than where it is on Amazon, which makes me feel really bad for the readers on Google Play. But um, one of my author friends actually had Google Play um, discounted her book, and so to where she didn't want it to be discounted, and she emailed them and asked them to raise the price. And they're like, it doesn't matter. We'll pay you based on the price that you have set on your end. And she goes, is that a glitch? And they're like, no, it's not on purpose. They're not doing that anymore. That's good. I just didn't want you to talk about it for like <laughs> five minutes. It's like they actually oh, okay. stopped that just a few months ago, I think this year. No, but she US said, and UK. she set the price to $65 and she paid people to buy the book for $65. And then she, no, they, she paid the people to buy the book for $3, which is what Google Play discounted to. And she had the price set at 65. So they were paying her a lot of money. And I was like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. She's like, well, I asked them and they said, go ahead. So yeah, that's good to know that they've stopped. So they've actually stopped price. I mean, doing random price drops or they, what, what was that? What were you saying? They've stopped. Um, so I actually don't know what your friend was doing. Cause to me, that seems really weird because you can actually find charts out there. They're very precise in how much they drop it. So you put this price to get it at three ninety nine, and it always worked for me. Um, but they've stopped this year, at least in the U S I believe, and maybe the UK I'll see. Uh, I'm not sure about the other stores, but they've stopped doing the arbitrary, we're going to drop your price. So you ought to be able to just put it up there at whatever you want to sell it at. 
That's fantastic. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> And they also, I, you know, and like I said, they, they said, yes, we're going to make improvements both on the reporting and all that stuff, but also about how people can get accounts. So it should be getting easier if you didn't respond to that email you got four years ago when you tried to sign up. Uh, right now they've got a promotions and advertising tab, which if you open it, because they asked me, do you do promotions on here? I was like, is that the thing where you open it and there's like this spreadsheet and you have to fill out and like email it back or something? They were like, yes like no I don't do promotions I looked at that and said I can just go in and drop the price manually which is right now all of that that would do anyway uh, both Google Play and Amazon asked like they ask if is there anything authors want and I said well you know Kobo if you do a promotion there you might have to pay ten dollars but they actually put you on a special page on their site and drive, drive traffic to it uh, so that's what I asked for I was like well how about you guys you know it'd be really cool if authors could not just lower their price for their own promotional efforts that they're doing, but maybe there's an opportunity to like highlight indie authors or something. Um, because when I went in there before I talked to them, you know, and I, I brought up Google Play Books on my phone just to see like, can I actually find any of my books? The answer was no. <laughs> you know, as, as traditional publishing was the default stuff. And even like, if I type something more specific, like steampunk, like keywords I knew I'd used in my book descriptions, I still didn't. Not on my phone, like maybe on the desktop app, you can, you know, see more than like seven books at a time. But what they, so I asked about that and they said that what they do, and this is why those people who get book bub ads pretty regularly are all telling me, yeah, I actually sell really well on Google Play and it doesn't drop off that much. It's based on... I mean, it's the same thing as Amazon too. It's based on like, if readers buy your books, they will start seeing your books in that, you know, when they log in as recommendations. So the more books you can sell on Google Play, the more your books are gonna get recommended to other readers. And what was interesting is they said that um, they actually monitor whether people finish books and that affects whether more, like more books in the series are gonna be recommended, so. Hopefully people are finishing your books as, but yeah, it was, it was kind of encouraging that if you can start selling on there, that you will continue to be promoted to the readers who have purchased your stuff. And that may be why I've not seen as much of a drop off there after I did gain some momentum as um, things drop off for me like pretty quickly at Kobo after a, you know, a, a few months after a book bub. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that? I think I had, oh yeah, go ahead. I have one more Google play thing to say, but. Actually, I've got a couple more things. Go ahead, though. <laughs> uh, I have used the spreadsheet schedule of promo thing. Uh, it's a little nerve wracking because, like, it, you, you don't know if you did it correctly until the price changes. Like, it's, I meant maybe it would throw an error if you did it wrong. I did it right and it didn't throw an error. And, like, on one hand, um, it's hokey and difficult and weird that a tech company wouldn't make it that hard. On the other hand, uh, at the time, it was the only thing I could do. That, it was the only place where I could schedule a price change. Everything else, I had to change it at a certain time and wait for it to propagate through. So knowing that it would change the price at exactly midnight on whatever West Coast time, uh, like it was, there was there was an attractiveness to that. Uh, but now price changes and promotions and stuff are a lot easier to schedule uh, on other things as well. So not quite as impressive. So I asked about that too, and they said, yes, we're gonna be making this easier to schedule promotions. No promises on whether that will actually give you extra visibility or if you're just dropping the price for promos that you're running. Um, I asked them, what is the best way to advertise on Google Play? Because not everybody can get a book bub, even those of us who got them fairly easily in the past, or you know, most of us are not getting as many or finding them maybe not as effective, especially if you're running the same books you've already run before. And, you know, they just, they seem to think Facebook ads are pretty good because you can target an Android specific operating system users on there. And that there's probably, you know, this was just a thought there's probably less people doing that than targeting like iOS for Apple stuff. Um, um, and then with Amazon, usually you, you target the Kindle as one of the people you want to select out, you know, what is it, negative interest or something? I don't remember, but you want all the sci-fi people, but only with Kindle as one of their interests. But, uh, we didn't mention in this episode specifically, but Google Play is the linked store for the Android phone. So that's, that's a really big audience. Um, as far as growth, because I asked, uh, interestingly, I, when I first got on there, maybe 2014, 
you know, I got like a couple hundred dollars a month, but it, it went up to, you know, I had a couple months where I like made five, 6,000 there in the last year or two. And it, it's not as high now because it's been a while since I've had like a good book club run, but it's still like 3,000 a month there, which is nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> So I'm like, is there going to be more? Are you building your audience? Is there going to be more ebook users? And they said, well, for them, and I think they're taking into account trad publishing too. They thought ebook sales were pretty flat, but they see a lot of upside with audiobooks, and they're actually planning to add a way to upload directly, um, the same as Kobo was, has already done. Uh, so right now, the only way to get your audiobooks there is through, I believe, through Find Away Voices. It's the way I have a series with them. And I'm actually going to have to go poke around in my Find Away Voices record and see is Google Play, are people buying them from Google Play? Because I, I knew they had audiobooks, but I wasn't really aware of that. I'm not an Android person, so that's the hard part is being aware of all the stores out there. Congratulations to those of you that actually have like all the devices <laughs> so that you can, you know, see the experience. Like I said, I tried to look on my iPhone in the Google Store, but since I don't actually buy there, it wasn't customized at all to me. All right. Do you have any final thoughts on Google Play before we move on? Uh, I will say I am an Android user, and I brought up books on my phone, and they're recommending a lot of my books to me, and then also some books from from uh, Lindsay Broker. So they're doing, and that's not even in the store. That's just the eBooks for You setting. So you should uh, buy those. I should buy those. <laughs> I actually have uh, I I have uh, Google Opinion points that I have accumulated that I can spend on on stuff, so I could just get them for free for answering questions. Um, but uh, I will say also, yeah, when they changed over to uh, the wholesale pricing is when they can discount to their heart's content and agency pricing is when you set the price and they can't change it. Uh, there was a, the, when they changed over, there's three, uh, I think it's the UK, uh, America, uh, this is the US and um, Australia are the, are the three right now where you can do a fixed price. And there was this whole thing where you can go through and like set your prices there and hit the little fixed price policy button. And I went through all that and did it. And I think it might be automatic now. So it was funny when I went through my entire thing to change them all. And then within a few days, it was just like, oh, I didn't, I didn't have to do that. So again, for a tech company, it seems odd how really clunky their back end can be sometimes. But the money is nice. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Lindsay. Oh, no, if you want to say, I was just going to say I did it recently because I realized a lot of my books were like six ninety nine or something still that, that should be three ninety nine or four ninety nine. But I and now they're, they're not price matching. I wanted to lower those and fix the keywords. So, yeah, I did it and it was automatic now. And I was just going to say that this is actually really good information to get out there because a lot of authors are under the impression that Google Play is 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 flaky, scammy, not flaky, scammy, but not reliable because they kept closing things down and. And it's hard for authors to get in there, but it's really awesome that they're actually making these kinds of adjustments and changes like this, this promotion spreadsheet. Why is that not being talked about more? You know, I mean, that's, that's really fantastic and being able to just kind of control things that way. Um, and so I'm, I like that, that this is information that's getting out there for people, for authors. I mean, and I like that they don't randomly price change. I mean, do do they say why they stopped doing that? Do either of you guys know why? I think what Jojo said, was it because of the changing the model? Yeah, they changed the model in three in three of their markets. It's the only thing I like. I know that that's that's why it's those three markets is because they changed to the agency model. I don't know what the motivation was. Probably a lot of authors complaining. <laughs> it is a possibility. All right, so let's move on. I wanted to talk just a little bit about one of the panels I did go to. This wasn't a panel. This was one person, Judith Anderley, talking about some of the things, the foreign rights stuff that they are doing she, you know, it sounds like she's kind of in charge of this with um, LM and I'm sorry, Michael, LMMPP. <laughs> I know I even know what the, I, he's told us what the initials stand for and I still can't remember the order. But um, they have so many properties now, they've really become a publisher, you know, not just one author or even one author doing collaborations. So she was talking about that, you know, with so much uh, IP basically that they can work with kind of what she's doing when because they've been traveling a lot and going to the book fairs they've even done stuff in China not just like London and Frankfurt book fairs and she's kind of just telling us what she's taken with her to like attract people that like you because you know as an independent author you're probably not going to want to pay for translations I mean you might uh Joanna Pangis was talking about she uh used AI to get the 
you know, baseline German translation of three of her books, then had editors, you know, human editors go in and, and make it sound human <laughs> and, and beta reader and stuff. So you can do that, but she even admitted on the show, it was a really big investment of her time. It's not something I really want to go through. I would much rather just sell my foreign rights. So that's why my ears perked up at this, at this talk. And I went, I, I was late, unfortunately, but, um, she did say she might be willing to come on the show in 2020. So we'll see if we can get her to talk about this stuff. But she so showed how the first thing they did, like for their first trip was um, making a sales sheet, which is basically just a flyer that kind of shows off their products with a few highlights. I mean, these, you know, she shows what she had now. I, I mean, it sounds like it may have been more basic in the beginning because she just hired someone through 99 designs. And the idea was to have something that you can hand to the foreign rights buyers in other countries if you meet them at these various book fairs. And um, later on, they, they did a catalog. So, you know, I looked through it there. It was really snazzy, you know, definitely professional. And these were just things that they could hand to these people that might be interested in buying their books. Obviously, their books sell well, that, you know, and that's a highlight. But she, she mentioned that when you were talking to these people, you might want to pick and choose what you actually want to emphasize. And, you know, she said, like, if you're someplace like China, they're not going to be impressed by how many Amazon reviews you have since Amazon's not even a thing there. Um, but if you put sales numbers, uh, you know, for somebody else, you might put your Amazon review average for a country where they might care more about that. Um, and she emphasized the importance of emphasizing what's in it for them, you know, not just like, hey, I would love for you to translate my books because that would be awesome for me, you know, kind of like, hey, these books have sold really well to these audiences and uh, won awards if, if they have, and, you know, you might be interested in picking them up. So, and they had also done some, uh, deal, you know, paying people to translate on their own too. So, it, you know, and it just depended on the countries and who was interested. Um, I think we've talked about before, but did you guys want to have any questions or thoughts on that or talk about stuff you've done related to that? Um, I can, I can say that, uh, like I, in my own experiences with selling foreign rights, I got the opportunity to do so when they approached me and it was always after a multi-week sales spike. Uh, so it certainly seems like sales are, you know, highly convincing to foreign rights people. And more to the point, though, like if you're going to put together a thing like a catalog or, or a sales sheet or something to sort of to, to, to show off, it seems like timing. Uh, uh, it, like if you have one ready for when you have either a planned or unplanned uh, sales spike, I think you're going to have a lot more success. So like it seems like this is a plan for when something goes right situation. And I don't have anything to add because I haven't done anything where foreign rights is concerned. So I'm just listening to you guys and going, someday. <laughs> well, and they, uh, you know, maybe you need someone on your team that's not afraid to just like say like these books have sold really well. Like even if the Amazon ranking is 50,000 now instead of 5,000, I don't think that's necessarily, same with the licensing stuff, you know, a deal breaker. Um, but, you know, if you are publishing regularly in the same genre, Hopefully you can kind of keep your backlist selling at a good clip too. Or if you're doing something where you're all in the same universe, that can keep things going. But yeah, I, I think your odds would be better uh, <laughs> if the books are selling really well. But I do think, it, you know, I don't know. I've been approached. I actually haven't gone forward with much. I have one book with a German publisher and only because a fan translated it and then pitched the publisher <laughs> and they, they were like, okay. So I was like, well, I had to do zero uh, for that. So that was okay. But, uh, it, you know, it's actually pretty good money out there, not necessarily from one country in one deal, but it could be cumulative. You know, if you can get like 10 different countries to buy your foreign rights, uh, definitely something worth considering, especially if you're the kind of person that thinks, oh, it'd be awesome to go to the Frankfurt, Frankfurt Book Fair. <laughs> I'm going to pencil that in for next year. Um, if you're going to go anyway, or London Book Fair, then why not get one of these flyers done? So you have something to hand out if you do happen to run in any of these people. But So that was actually my question. I mean, so it's okay to wait. I mean, I've always just waited for somebody to approach me. So you're saying it's okay to approach them. Yeah, that's why they're there. They're there to make deals was okay. the impression I got. So I, I'm also like a wait to be approached person because obviously Joe and I, I think we're both the hardcore introverts on the show. Like go to a book fair and pitch your stuff. What? <laughs> and Why I'm would like you a, do this horrible thing? I'm like, I don't want to go to a book fair. 
I actually think it'd be neat. Traveling. <laughs> yeah, but if it would be an excuse to go to like Germany or London, it could be yeah. neat. So, all right. The last um, talk I was going to go over, yeah, is just um, I went to Chris Fox did an update on his. I think the talk was kind of writing the trend versus creating trends, or maybe he would no, he was writing to market 2.0, but he talked a little bit about trends and writing. And one of the things he brought up was sort of the difference between writing the trend, which is kind of easy to identify a trend if you, you know, watch your top 100 list and your genres on Amazon regularly and, you know, kind of go out and research that stuff. Um, but then it's another option is creating a trend, which is harder. <laughs> you know, you may be creating a mashup or a new genre from scratch and hoping it will be successful. Um, he talked a little bit about his uh, fantasy mixed with sci-fi series he's done with magic in space basically and having success with that and then obviously lit rpg for those of you who don't know it's like the gaming literature you know for fans of like world of warcraft and stuff like that came out of somebody publishing a bunch of those and then a whole bunch of other people realizing wow this is a hungry market and it's basically starting a new trend and if you're able to do this <laughs> you know you can really ride that wave right um people will jump in eventually if they see that it's really doing well, but as a early adopter <laughs> or the, the maker of the trend, you know, that's uh, obviously you're going to have some advantages there. Uh, it's like easier to write a trend, but if you're able to create a trend and if you're already, you know, middle to big as an author, you're probably going to have better luck because uh, you can get things rolling. You probably have more money to do it. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on this? Have you, I, I admit to being kind of stubborn myself and not wanting to write to trends. So I'm like, maybe if I write enough series, eventually I'll accidentally start a trend. <laughs> I don't know. Just wishful thinking on my part, probably, since I've never been any kind of trendsetter of any sort in anything. I've, uh, like, I, I, I can only see my own experience is, like, uh, first off, if you're going to write to market or, or, or write to a trend, uh, and I've said this in previous episodes, make sure that you know why most people like that uh, genre, not just you, because you might be an outlier. Uh, I, have, I have had success and failure in writing things that weren't strictly to trend, uh, because I just wrote the parts that I liked best and not potentially what people were looking for. Uh, and also, uh, if you're going to write to trend, and like, if you screw up, if you say write a uh, an urban, fan, or let's say you write a, uh, a steampunk that is not strictly to trend because it's it's not uh, it's not strictly to genre because it's not you know taking place in Victorian England or other things that I did, uh, you have now created your own thing. It is subtly different and therefore your own. And if it's really popular, that's how a trend is created. There's a, a voice actor I listen to who says that when you're a voice actor, always try to do the new celebrity impression. Because if you succeed, congratulations, now you can do that impression. And if you fail, congratulations, now you've created a new character. So like with books, it's the same thing. Like, I'm not saying always try to follow a trend, but if, if a trend interests you, even if you can't hit it exactly on, like if you do hit it exactly on, congratulations, you're writing to market and there's great success in that. If you don't hit it exactly on, but it's the sort of thing that really resonates with readers, then that's how a trend is created. So I think it's, it's always worth pursuing a thing if it interests you and if you're passionate about it i don't think you can fake passion and uh, an interest and i'm i don't write to trend i find out later on that elemental magic is a thing i'd never even heard of avatar when i wrote my series and you know all of these different little things all the series that i write written and like i just found out that my main series is academy and i'm like well I could have jumped on that boat with a 10 book series, you know? So I'm always a little bit behind the trend when it comes to writing to market. I usually just write what, what I love. Um, but it's always fun to find that there is a market for what you've written and that it's popular, like the Academy stuff. So my books, I've re I've rebranded them as Academy, just the first four books in the 10 book series, and they're doing better than they were before. And so it's kind of interesting, you know, just, I'm going to see how long that wave rides out and, and take advantage of that for a little bit. I don't think I've ever accidentally written something that was <laughs> the trend. It's just, it's never, you know, I very purposely put some dragons in my story after seeing Daniel Aronson's dragon books, always killing it like 2011, 2012. I was like, that's, you know, dragons are kind of fun. I can make dragons work for this series. And now it's funny because I'm like always posting dragon stuff on Facebook and they've appeared in many more series. And I actually wasn't planning to become the dragon person, but they are kind of fun. 
I don't know. Um, this was not at Chris's talk, but kind of on this topic. I just had a little chat outside of the, the waterfall bar <laughs> with um, Alex Newton from Kalytics and Martha Carr. And I think Rami was there too, Rami Vance, R.E. Vance, I believe he writes under for Urban Fantasy stuff. And, you know, they were kind of like, hey, are there any new fantasy trends coming out that we could take advantage of? Because, um, you know, and Kayla's Alex kind of watches this stuff. And he's even, like, he's talked about Reverse Harem. He's talked about Lit RPG. He's talked about Witch Cozies. And um, now the Academy Urban Fantasy that you probably noticed just if you're watching the Urban Fantasy category, how many of those. You're like, wow, another Academy. Interesting. <laughs> There's a lot of them. And, you know. So they were kind of like, do you, do you have any insight into what's the next new thing? And Alex said something that I'd actually thought about before, but he said it like way more articulately than <laughs> you know I did. But he pointed out that either unconsciously or consciously, you've got these authors that are you know working together to create these trends. They're just basically deciding what the next new thing is within the greater blanket of their genre and throwing a whole lot of advertising dollars in it. And because they're pushing it so much it ends up becoming a trend it ends up becoming like 10 out of the top 100 books in urban fantasy or you know academy stories right now maybe and that you know he's like well why couldn't people if they're not doing it on purpose already which they may be you know why couldn't a bunch of people just say like hey we are going to have um mermaid cozies start to be the next big thing you know and i actually having watched you know just kind of watch stuff on the outside for a while for a romance you know I, I wonder I'm like are, is it just because a several powerful powerful big selling with money to advertise authors to get together or just accidentally start all promoting the same thing and that becomes a trend and then once people have read three or four they're like oh there's more good I'm going to keep reading this because I like these have you do you guys have any thoughts on that no I, I think that makes a lot of sense and I think like even again it when it's if you're writing a thing, oh, that looks cool. I think I'll do that. Uh, like, I think that if enough people become interested in a the thing, then a trend can form out of it. And certainly, if you uh, happen to be a good author who can write stuff that's engaging, and you're a good author in that you are good at the author business, then it's almost inevitable that if if it's a fruitful enough uh, subgenre, then you're going to start to see some tra traction come down because we're the ones, you know, we're content creators, and once content is available, people can start uh, uh, consuming it. Yeah, I love, I, I think trends, it's fascinating. This stuff does fascinate me, even though I don't write to trend. I don't, I don't write fast enough. Like I can write my books fast, but I can't get them out fast enough with my kids schedule. And I'm not a, I'm not able to pivot very quickly because I will focus on a full series before I'm ready to start another series. And that's probably one of my downfalls when it comes to hopping on trends really quickly. And so I'm not, um, I'm hoping in the future I'll be able to hop on trends faster, but it's just, it's too hard for me to jump from series to series, but it still fascinates me hugely. And I'm like, as soon as this series is done, I hope that thing's still big. Cause I would love to write that. <laughs> so. Well, I think then it's probably wiser to, to, to focus on one series and finish it before, you know, cause then you get some of these folks that write to market or write to trend that have like eight book ones, <laughs> you know, and like the only one series where they've actually kind of completed the series and you wonder if the fans are okay with that or I don't know. I feel like I still have a couple of series I haven't finished and I'm like, you know, working on finishing them off in between other stuff just because I, I don't want to have like this whole bunch of incomplete stuff in my catalog. So that's why if you created a trend, you wouldn't have to worry about jumping on it in time. So <laughs> All right. Do you guys want to wrap up or do you, do you want to ask, ask a question, Andrea, from Facebook? We, um, we have we, a chat we, on the yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like sitting here trying to answer the question in the chat. Um, do I mean, we can, uh, we can answer the question later if we want to, uh, once we have more people in the group or we can answer it now. Uh, it's about audiobooks so, and narrators. Why don't so, we do, we actually ended up talking about an hour, right? <laughs> Yeah, on <laughs> my roundup that was going to be 20 minutes. So why don't we just, we'll save the ones we have and we'll do a Q&A question, Q&A episode the next time it's it's just us, if that sounds good. Yeah, know. that'll be in about, um, um, is it four weeks? Because we've got a guest next time and a guest the time after that and a guest the time after that. Wow, it's so trendy to be on our show right now. We're creating a and, trend. <laughs> and I just got pitched in the middle of this episode for another show by somebody who we all recognize and know. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, 
we might then what we might do because I think we have the Christmas and New Year's we didn't book anybody for like those couple weeks so we could pre pre record a couple of Q and A shows so send them to us guys we'll we'll definitely get to them it may just be a few weeks out. All right, Joe, do you want to wrap us up? I think my voice is taking the last little, sure. <laughs> the last yeah. pitch. So, uh, all right. So thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, please visit sixfigureauthors.com with the number six for episode notes and to leave a comment or to ask a question for future shows, as we have just discussed. Also, please hop on to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, your favorite podcast place. Leave a review if you can. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. Bye. So long, everybody. <laughs>